The first thing to note is Western modern science is a 16th and 17th century invention. It hasn't been uh, around in the form it is today. It, it hasn't been around for all that long. Prior to that time, of course, there were other ways of knowing the world, and there still are today many other ways of knowing the world. But our concern at the moment in this lecture series is with a particular way of knowing the world, and that particular way that we're exploring as we go through is Western modern science. So in pre-modern Europe, science didn't exist. Science as it is now didn't exist. Uh, what did exist was natural philosophy, was termed natural philosophy. Uh, natural philosophy differs from science as it's uh, from Western modern science as we know it now in a number of uh, important respects. Um, one key difference is the reliance of natural philosophy on argument from axiomatic first principles, a form of reasoning that began with things that were agreed and through, uh, through a dialogue, um, through discourse, uh, through debate and argument, through reasoning and rationality, things that were not agreed uh, were arrived at. Now, through this period, through the 16th and 17th centuries, we see all over the world, particularly, uh, particularly uh, in, in um, the case of Western science in Europe, of course, uh, we see a new way of knowing the world. Uh, and the characteristics of this new way of knowing the world are a reliance on empiricism, a reliance on induction, on experimentation, on hypothesis testing. Uh, these processes were not deployed systematically in the medieval period or systematically in the classical period. Now, of course, that's not to say that experimentation, for example, that experimenting was invented in the 16th or 17th century. I'm, I'm not arguing that. People have been experimenting uh, for many thousands and thousands of years. Uh, every time somebody cooks a meal and uses a different spice or uses a different temperature, that they are conducting a, a, an experiment. But what we're talking about here is a much more systematic process uh, of knowing the world. As a consequence of this new, uh, this different um, method, this empiricism, we see the deployment of a whole lot of instruments. Instruments like microscopes and telescopes and prisms and, and so forth, again, are systematically deployed. Now, the important thing here too is not so much the instrument itself, but the idea that the instrument materialises. So take the scalpel, for example. A scalpel is simply a sharp knife. And people have been using sharp knives for a long, long time. But the idea of anatomy, the idea of knowing a body, not by talking about the body, not by arguing about the body, but by cutting the body open, slicing it into, into sections, <coughs> carving one section from another section. In Europe, this was a new way of knowing, this way of knowing by actually you know, um, dissecting, by reducing the whole into the parts, by seeing how the parts interacted, interacted with one another, this was a new way of knowing. The, the prism did that to light. The, the microscope does this to, uh, to small objects. The scalpel did it to human bodies. We see different, in this period in Europe, we see different languages being deployed to discuss the universe, nature, the world. The most important of these languages is mathematics and algebra and the related formal languages like uh, calculus and so forth. And the natural philosophers understood the world by using natural language, informal 
language. Here in the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, we see mathematics being said to be the language of nature. We, we, hear, we hear people talking about the natural world, the universe, speaking in formulae, speaking mathematics. And we see people arguing that without mathematics, the universe is not knowable. And today, of course, that tradition, uh, that tradition holds. It's not possible to study physics without having a strong grasp of mathematics. Interestingly, though, this is um, all that I'm saying today, by the way, is contested. All that I'm saying today is highly debatable. And uh, ne next, uh, next lecture, I'll be arguing some other points of view. But in respect of mathematics and algebra and so forth, uh, those are, I, I understand that um, many of you, perhaps most of you, are computer scientists. And you'll be aware of the work of uh, Stephen Wolfram. Uh, who developed Mathematica, the, the software Mathematica, and he's developed uh, various cellular automata and, and other, um, uh, other pieces of important uh, computer code. Um, he's argued uh, in a book, um, The New Science, I think it's called, um, for a new language, he, a new language in which to describe the universe. His argument is that mathematics is an inadequate language to describe the world of physics, the, the world of biology, the world of chemistry. He, he, he argues that, um, uh, that algebra is also inadequate. He argues that the language that should be used to understand the universe is algorithms. Algorithms like recursive algorithms, for example. And that an algorithmic approach to physics, for example, or to biology will be, he argues, more revealing than mathematics has been um, to date. So th those of you who, who, particularly with an interest in computer science and the use of, uh, of recursion and so forth, might like to follow up on Wolfram's work. We've seen that the East has been deeply involved in this Western move, um, that important aspects of mathematics and cosmology and medicine and formal logic, etc., etc., were developed in the East prior to the West, would, or were developed in the East at, a, at the same time as the West, and in many cases there was a shift uh, from uh, East uh, to West as uh, Westerners uh, appropriated these techniques and, and these tools and, and these ways of knowing. We heard the, uh, uh, the Dean of Computer Science talk about how philosophy was important to him, uh, to his work uh, as a computer scientist and arguing that research needs an exposure, uh, sorry, that uh, research students in, in particular, but also us old ones, uh, need a continuous exposure to uh, the philosophy of science. The example that we discussed last week of Western modern science, an, an example which um, an example which, exempl which really does exemplify and characterise many of the uh, structural elements, the, the formalised elements of Western modern science is logical positivism or empirical positivism, it's sometimes called. And so we used, uh, in, in a lecture a couple of lectures ago, uh, we used logical positivism as the example of uh, of a particular approach to knowing, the approach to knowing that we call uh, Western modern science. And the features of that are that nature speaks, we ask the questions, nature answers the questions, that authority doesn't answer the questions. Nature answers the question. How does nature answer the question? Nature answers through empirical study of nature, through very careful, objective observation and testing and probing of nature. In that way, nature is made to speak. Nature is made to answer these questions. The objective here of the, of the logical positivists or the empirical positivists is justified truth. Now, and I'll be saying more about justified truth 
um, today and at exactly what they meant by justified truth. We saw, though, that this approach that suggests that through empirical methods, through careful observation of nature, nature could be made to speak and justified truth could be achieved, we see that this is critiqued and uh, severely critiqued to a point where the logical positivists or the empirical positivists today uh, are no longer the dominant force in the philosophy of Western science. Now, that's not to say that they're still without influence. They are, the, the empiricism remains uh, you know, highly influential. This search for justified truth remains uh, highly influential. However, uh, there, there, was, uh, there were some very severe cri uh, criticisms of the logical positivists. The person that we're using, or the, the school of thought that we're using to critique the logical positivists uh, is the work of Popper. Uh, we could have chosen others, but um, Popper is the, is the uh, predominant uh, uh, critic here. And what he was drawing attention to was the problem with induction. And, th and, and that problem is easily grasped. Uh, it simply states uh, that uh, past, past events are not justifiable proof of future events. That, uh, that uh, the move from data that has already been captured to data that has not yet been captured it, it is a move that entails a gap and uh, jumping across jumping across that gap is jumping from what is known not to something that is proved perhaps to something that is highly likely but not to something that is proved so popper pointed out that this objective of the positivists to you know, in the term positivist here, to get to the truth, a positive understanding of what the truth is through empirical methods is shown to be a hopeless task by, by Popper. However, Popper is able to demonstrate that propositions can be proved to be false. Whilst propositions cannot be proved to be true using induction, Propositions can be shown to be false using induction. Popper, therefore, argue, and Popper and the school associated with Popper, therefore argued that it's very important that a hypothesis be framed in such a way that it is in principle possible for it to be demonstrated to be false. That if a proposition is framed in a way that cannot be where the proposition cannot be shown to be false, then the proposition is saying nothing. The proposition is empty of content. And we looked at a number of examples, uh, a, a number of examples of that. So, moving on now to new material. Popper's uh, contribution uh, on the reliance um, on induction, you know, demonstrated that it doesn't matter. How objective and careful the scientist is in capturing the data, and it doesn't matter how much data is captured, Hume's point about the, about the problems of induction can't be overcome. Now, here we come to an interesting point about Popper, and, and one that remains influential today. Whilst, like the logical positivists who've gone, who, who've taken um, the, a back seat, if, if you know what I mean, who, who are no longer at the forefront of the philosophy of science. So Popper is no longer at the forefront of the philosophy of science. Um, but in this point here, uh, he remains influential. His, the, 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 the conclusion to draw from, from these two things here, empiricism is not enough, induction is not enough, is that all knowledge is therefore provisional, conjectural, hypothetical, you can never finally, according to Popper, you can never finally prove a point. You can merely provisionally demonstrate that the point is not disproved. 